All right, we're going to talk about devilish shoes today. Devilish shoes. I want you to look in Ephesians chapter 6. We're dealing with our main text in verse 15, our spiritual warfare series. It says in verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 6, as we continue preaching through this chapter, Stand, therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is another important part of our spiritual armor. We're now dealing with the shoes as a protection in battle. And having feet shod means to have your feet shooed. Having your feet shooed. Dear Lord, we do pray that You give us good order in the house of God. That, Lord, it would not be despised, Your truth. Lord, You've chosen by the foolishness of preaching in this age to save. And Lord, it's You that ordained the local church and the local pastor. And I pray, God, that You would feed this people and help us, God, to respond to Your truth and Your ways. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Having our shoes on in the Bible speaks of readiness. Are you ready? It speaks of haste, of zeal. Let me show you. Exodus chapter 12. Thus shall ye eat it. Talking about the Passover. With your loins girded. And what does it say? Your shoes on your feet. Your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in what? Haste. Alright. Having your shoes on your feet. It's associated with haste. Readiness. Preparation. We will speak more, God willing, about the gospel of peace in the future. But in short, the gospel of peace is the message of peace with God through Jesus. But wait a second. If it's a message, a proclamation of peace, an offer of peace through Jesus, this implies war. Have you ever thought about that? It implies a quarrel. Listen to me. It implies that God has been angry with you. It implies that there is a problem with God. Not because of any sin in God, but because of sin in you. And the message of peace is that the Lord will accept you now through Jesus. But you have to understand the bad news. To appreciate the good news. Isn't that right? Nowadays, you go and give the gospel of peace to folks and they say, well, of course, I've always been at peace with God. Well, something's missing, isn't it? Something's missing. You have the Old Testament before you have the New Testament. All of those types and pictures, the law, to show you that you need what? Wake up, amen. What do you need? You need a Savior, do you not? Amen. Amen. So being diligent and zealous and willing to give this gospel of peace to mankind, it's a crucial part of your armor. Do you know that when you become a active, continual, habitual soul winner, it becomes a protection for you in your Christian life. You begin to grow and you begin to mature and you begin to be protected from the devil in ways you would not be if you were not active in soul winning, to whatever degree you can. When we're occupied about the king's business, you're not going to have time for the devil's business. 
And there are many ways that soul winning protects us, it keeps us, it shields us. The way shoes protect the feet and keep the soldier standing. What I want to show you today, and I want you to remember, the Lord said go out quickly. And we'll talk about that in the future. The Lord said go out quickly. He wants some zeal about soul winning. He doesn't want somebody to have to pry you up off the pew or off the bed to get you winning soul. The Lord said go out quickly. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 21.8, the king's business requires haste. And I tell you what, we got the King of King, and He has some business, and He has not been shot. He has been very clear explaining what His business is. He says, I come to seek the law. I come, and as, the, as my Father has sent me, so I send you. Go ye out into the world. The Bible wants you to win souls. He that winneth souls is wise. The Lord wants you to have a zeal about this thing. But when you're slothful, you dishonor the Lord. When you make excuses, you dishonor the Lord. And the devil knows all of this. And he does everything he can to get your feet off track. One way the devil keeps you from being a motivated soul winner is to get you to put on fancy shoes instead of your war shoes. Now, I want you to realize that Satan comes as a serpent. He's called the serpent. He's called that old serpent in the Bible. He appeared in the form of a serpent in Genesis. And uh, I want you to see that God put that serpent on His belly. So I have a question for you today. What in the world does the devil know about shoes? Have you thought about that? Do you think a serpent knows anything about shoes? God got rid of his legs. He doesn't have any feet. I don't believe the devil knows much about shoes. He knows enough to mess your feet up. He knows enough to give you some type of shoes where you get over here wearing them and you're all proud of your fancy shoes and you feel nice and secure and He goes over and just barely pushes you and you fall over. That's why the devil wants to change your shoes. The devil is a fallen cherub. And I want to tell you today, the devil has hoofs. Let me show you. And again, whether you look at the devil as a serpent or look at the devil as a fallen cherub, my question to you today is what does the devil know about shoes? What does the devil know about shoes? Ezekiel 28, talking about Lucifer, says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. So what is Lucifer? What is the devil? A cherub. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. So he's a cherub that rebelled against God. But let me show you. Ezekiel gets to see some cherubs in Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10. And he says in chapter 10, verse 20, This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Kibar. And I knew that they were the cherubim. And he describes these cherubim in chapter 1. And he says their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. I tell you what, if the devil wants to give you shoes, I don't think they're going to fit. I don't think they're going to be the kind of shoes that people need to be wearing. Maybe they're good for a cow. Maybe they're good for some ox. But they're not people's shoes. Now, I believe they just might be fancy shoes. 
They sparkled like the color of burnished brass. I don't know. They just might be fashionable shoes. But one thing we know about the devil, if God says, put your shoes on, the shoes that I want to give you that are part of your armor, if God says, I have shoes for you and it is the armor of God and I want you to put on my shoes that I have for you that will protect you from the devil, then I know good and well when the devil gives you his shoes, the imitation counterfeit shoes that he wants you to wear, I know one thing. That when the battle begins and you get out there in your fancy shoes, you're going to fall down. You're not going to be able to jump out of his way. You're not going to be able to remain standing. And he's going to laugh and he's going to get the victory. The whole goal here is to stand and fight to resist the devil that he may flee. Now, if the shoes represent your zeal and your haste and your willingness and your readiness to go soul winning, then I know what the devil's going to do. He's going to hinder you from going soul winning. And God says, I have a protection for you. It's called soul winning. And the devil's going to say, oh, but I have something else you can do as a Christian. And I have a totally different design for your shoes, the foundation of your Christian life. And you're going to end up falling away, away from your responsibility. We've spoken before about modern shoes actually harming you. The higher the hill and the more the so-called support, the worse it can be for your back and knees and feet. And what I want to tell you today is that license. Licensed experts in various fields are destroying this world today. If you ask me, you say, what do you think is wrong with America? Oh, I could say many things, but I might put my finger and say, you know, this certifying and licensing of experts in every field, that's destroying America. It's destroying the health of the people. The Bible says, hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Which means when you get a bunch of worldly experts together, I tell you what, as they sit there and gloat in their pride, the Bible says they're really embracing foolishness. The Bible says whatever this world esteems is an abomination to God. It sounds like this world and God are in conflict. And it sounds like the experts of this world, nine times out of ten, end up doing the opposite of that which really will help you. Oh, I could sit here on this theme for a long time. I might go back to the 20s and show you how the experts killed a whole generation of your grandparents with Crisco and margarine, because the experts said it's better than butter. Oh, they don't say that anymore. After giving millions of people heart disease in America, people say, well, what's going to protect people? How about common sense and you investigating and researching whether or not you want to buy somebody's product or listen to their advice? How about you make the decision? Do you need government to make the decision for you? You need Big Brother to come and tell you? You say, oh, without licensing, oh, can you imagine? Well, get a private organization to license whoever. If you want doctors to be licensed, give a private organization to do it. If you want a nutritionist to be licensed, get a private organization to do it. And then you get to decide whether you want to hear or trust that private organization. It's very simple. But with government licensing, they prohibit all others from practicing. They don't even get to object. So it becomes a money-making, a money-making, controlling racket. And you don't get a choice anymore. With a private organization licensing, I can decide whether I want to trust them and use whoever they license in whatever field, but it's my choice. But 
But the real key to this thing is the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And I think people dying and being hurt and harmed is evil. So money is behind this thing, the love of money. You have to follow the money. In everything, you have to follow the money. In everything, you have to ask the question, what industry would be hurt if this truth came out? Or if this view became mainstream? How much money is made off of the current mainstream view that is marketed? The current mainstream view. Oh, they will allow a little bit of objection, but no real objection. It's controlled. Now, apply this to shoes. Certainly, there are bigger things that this whole racket is in control of. But nevertheless, let's just start right down at the bottom. Let's start with your shoe. What kind of shoes does Satan want you to put on? Well, if you're supposed listen to me. If you're supposed to be fighting and resisting, then obviously he wants you to put on some wobbly shoes, some unstable shoes, some type of bulky shoe where he can walk over and you feel like you're so secure and all of a sudden he can just throw a dart, poke at you a few times, and you're unstable and you're falling. You know what I think the devil wants you in? I believe the devil wants you in pretty boy, positive preacher platform shoes. In the 1970s, young men started walking around in high heels. They called themselves rockers. Were they fighters? Were they warriors? They're rockers. Hey, you got a lot of preachers that are rockers. Are the shoes for fighting? You know what they're for? Show. Hey, that's what's happened. The Lord wants you to walk in soul winning, warrior shoes, stable shoes. And the devil comes in and says, put on some show shoes. Put on some pretty boy rocker shoes. And what you have today is instead of preachers contending, instead of preachers resisting the devil, what you have is compromise. What you have is the Joe Osteen generation. He might as well have big hair and platform shoes because what he's doing spiritually and philosophically, it's all for show. I believe Absalom might have worn some platform shoes. Pretty boy, big hair, Absalom. I believe Satan wants preachers to leave the work of an evangelist. And he wants them to become performers. And I believe what God wants for you is to... Let little earrings dangle out of your nose and out of your ear and put your platform shoes on and walk around and say, I'm cool, I'm hip, and be one of those hip, cool Christians instead of a soul winner. Amen? I'm going to show people that it's cool to be a Christian. We have performers. Big hair. Big smile. Big heels. And what I'm telling you is that you're easily moved. The bigger the hill, the easier you fall down. And so the whole goal is for the devil to move you wherever he wants you to go. See, in the Bible you're to be steadfast, unmoved. But the devil wants it to where he can just give you a push and you go wherever he pushes you. Because you have no stability. You You have no ability to resist. Well, let me ask you a question today. Have you been moved? Do you have good, stable, soul-winning shoes on? Or has the devil been able to move you? Let me ask you a question. How easy is it for the devil to put out your soul-winning fire? How easy is it for the devil... 
How easy was it for the devil to put out your soul when in fire? What excuse does he give you? How easy were you pushed off the stable ground with stable shoes? What happened to your zeal? What happened to your readiness? What happened to your love for the lost and for the responsibility that God has given you? And I'm telling you, if the devil has put out your soul when in fire, you're unprotected. You're unprotected. You're a sitting duck. It's only a matter of time until you begin to look and maybe one day you'll see how far you did drift. If your soul went in fire, is not engaged. If it's not burning, I'm telling you, if you don't have on the stable shoes of a soul winner, I'm telling you today, you're drifting and you don't even know it. You're drifting and you don't even see how your heart's changing. You think you're in control. It's like being at the beach and all of a sudden looking up and realizing that you're a mile away from where you started out. Over and over again, we keep seeing the same thing. Over and over again, there's something that I believe is amazing. Listen to me. At the same time that preachers and churches are spiritually naked, and the Lord warns in the last days, keep your garments, lest your nakedness be seen. At the same time, that preachers and churches are spiritually naked. Think about this, church of God. Is it not ironic that they are also literally naked? At the same time that they are rich and in need of nothing and do not realize that they are spiritually naked, they're literally naked. Something's going on here. You have the spiritual, and then you have the physical following the spiritual to give you a perfect example of what's happening spiritually. They're both true. Let me give you another example. At the same time that the spiritual bread, the Word of God, is being corrupted by adding things to it that should not be in there and taking things from it and refining it or revising it in a way that God does not authorize, at the same time that the spiritual bread is being corrupted, what is happening in the physical world? What in the world are people eating? They're eating light, fluffy, white bread that says it's been enriched with a whole bunch of man-made vitamins. Why has it been enriched with a whole bunch of man-made drugs? i tell you why. Because they took out the good part of the bread. They made it fluffy, though. What do they do to the Bible? They took out the good part of the bread. It added a whole bunch of man's so-called wisdom, synthetic nourishment. And they made it fluffy. It's not rugged like that King's English. Over and over again, we see the same thing. At the same time, you have a spiritual corruption. You have a physical corruption as a picture. Okay. There's so many others. I won't spend time on it, but let's get to the point today. Think about it. 
At the same time that the devil is leading churches, Christians, to forsake soul winning like never before in history. How many Christians do you meet and say, oh, well, you shouldn't preach on the street. You shouldn't tell people they're sinners. You shouldn't, you shouldn't deal with them and tell them they're going to hell or the lake of fire without Jesus. You shouldn't reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. No, you shouldn't do anything that the Holy Spirit, God said, I sent the Holy Spirit to come. Jesus said they hate me because I testify to them that they are evil. I tell you, but no, you're not to follow Jesus. You're not to follow the Holy Spirit. But you have this new way, the psychological way. The way that says, just try to be a good person and stay out of people's business. Entertain them. At the same time that the devil is leading the majority of churches in America to forsake soul winning, to have no zeal, about souls, to become lukewarm, to have no boldness, no zeal, no willingness. At the same time that the shoes, the spiritual shoes, have been taken off the people of God. In the literal Or shall I say the physical? The world and Christians right there among them have gone crazy for modern shoes that are ruining people's feet and their backs and their knees and their hips and hindering running the very thing they're supposed to be helping. They're hindering exercise. They are hindering self-defense. Now, you don't find that just a little bit ironic? The last statement I made certainly needs some backing. So let me take a little while to show you what the devil has done in the natural. And we'll then conclude with how he has done the same thing in the spiritual. I'll start with the Lord to show you a very important truth that the devil has corrupted. In Mark chapter 6, he sent out his disciples two by two. It says in Mark chapter 6, verse 7, he called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth two by two. Notice. This was a set time. It was a set event. And although God can use accidental providential soul winning, it's good to have a set orderly time. Soul win on purpose. Amen? Be open to the Lord for any breaking up of your routine. But let's have a set time. Where you go. But notice, he tells them, be shod with Nikes. Did he say that? Oh, well, hey, you're going to have to go all around Jerusalem door knocking. I mean, you've got to go house to house through all the cities of Israel. Uh, you're going to spend all this time. Uh, you're going to do a lot of walking. So obviously the Lord would want him to have the best walking shoe that money can buy. But he said, be shooed with sandals. Whatever a sandal is, it gets down there close to the sand, doesn't it? It's what we would call a minimal shoe. And they went out and preached that men should repent. They did a lot of walking. And I do not believe the Lord would have sent them walking in a way that would have hurt them. And I learned from all of this, from the Lord, who makes the wisdom of the world foolishness. He exposes it as foolish. 
I learned from the Lord that a minimal shoe is what's good for walking. Now, tell that to the wisdom of this world today. Oh, if you're going to do a lot of walking or running, you better put a minimal shoe on. They say, oh, you're crazy. I need support. I paid $150 for my shoe. This is a good walking shoe. Yeah, probably in about a couple of months here, your back will start hurting and your legs will hurt. You'll probably have an injury. Now, this was not a strange or special occasion. Because this is what his preachers throughout the Bible always wore. We see Peter in Acts chapter 12. The angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy Nikes. Well, there you go. That's the NIV version. Gird thyself and bind on thy what? Sandals. And so he did. Preachers walked around in sandals. Hey, Paul walked almost 12 to 20 miles one time in the book of Acts. Now, the ancient sandals were not always open-toed, if you look at some of the illustrations and pictures of them. But one thing about them, they were very, very minimal. They were a minimal shoe. There wasn't much to it. But it did have enough to support a person walking, maybe on ground. It would be easier to have some type of bottom. Now, Christians continued in this understanding. Let me read to you from Clement of Alexandra in A.D. 195. Not too long after the book of Revelation was written. One generation later. And remember what I'm showing you is that there's been a corruption in the spiritual I'm showing you that the same time the churches are spiritually naked, they're literally naked. The same time the Word of God, the bread of life, is being refined and corrupted, your literal bread in the store is being corrupted. And in the same way, the same time that the churches of America and of the world are taking off their soul-winning shoes, we have a change in shoes. Tell you what, if you really think about it and grab a hold of what I'm saying, it'll give you chill. Clement of Alexandria in A.D. 195, he says, More than that, they emasculate plain food, namely bread, by straining off the nourishing part of the grain. He's upset that they're refining bread in such an idiotic way that the nourishing part is not even eaten by people. It sounds like the modern American diet with your white pasta and white rice and white bread that's been chemically bleached and all the other things. He goes on to say in the instructor in book two, women, they ought for the most part to wear shoes for it is not suitable for the woman's foot to be shown naked. But for a man, bare feet are quite in keeping except when he is on military service. What is the context that we're reading about in Ephesians chapter 6? Warfare. A military man. Somebody with a shield and a helmet and a sword. That's why you got shoes on. To go with bare feet is most suitable for exercise and best adapted to health and ease. Well, that goes against your 20th century modern expert researcher. This man must be an idiot, right? I, I mean, what type of idiot would tell you? I mean, you have to have lots of protection for your foot. You can't have your foot all mashing around and conforming to the ground. I mean, you've got to protect that poor precious foot. But Clement says it's most suitable for exercise and best adapted to health and ease. But if we cannot endure bare feet, we may use a type of slipper or dusty foot named on account of their bringing the feet near the dust. He talks about the understanding of the time of women not exposing their feet. Of course, Jeremiah 13 talks about the nakedness of a woman's foot. Clement goes on to call women, and I thought it was interesting, he goes on to call women to a natural beauty in all areas. Isn't that sweet? He says, moderation in diet 
And healthy living is the true way to natural beauty. His words are beauty according to nature. I think that's the best beauty. I think how God designed something is the best beauty. But the question we want to ask today is, who is right when it comes to walking shoes? The Lord who sent them out walking in sandals? And the Christians like Clement that said, whatever you do for exercise and a lot of activity, don't use much of a shoe. Who's right? The Lord and the Christians or Nike? Hey, God says butter is good and it will bless you. Butter and honey shall he eat. But man said margarine and Crisco. God said olive oil, but man said Crisco. Why would you want to use Crisco? Oh, it protects your heart. Hey, they cut people open. You know what they find out in their heart? Vegetable oil. That ain't God's butter. That ain't God's olive oil. I'm asking you now. People follow the experts. Hey, it was the experts that said, don't spank your children. Dr. Spock, it's a transition they're going through when they're young. Let them go ahead and have that tantrum. They'll be so blessed when they get older. Who was right? God or the professional? Hey, he wasn't just Spock. He was Dr. Spock. Who's right? The experts at Nike or the ancient Bible and the ancient Christians? You take your choice. You know, God says He hates Nike. Notice He says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 15, so has thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Yeah. Nike is the winged god of victory, the false god of victory. And when the devil brings you victory, it's always defeat. Hey, when the devil brings you liberty, it's always bondage. When the devil brings you healing, it's always death. Now, what does this mean? Nico, Nike, the winged god of victory. Nico, laitan, laity, people, common people. What does this mean? Victory over the people. Nicolaitanism. Domination. Control over the people. Jesus says, I hate it. I believe Nicolaitanism, if you take the word for what it says, is the domination of the people by licensed so-called experts that cannot be questioned. Nicolaitanism. Truth is whatever they say it is. And you have no right to even object. Or hear a second opinion. And guess what? They don't have to prove it. Because if you're in the Nicolaitan priestly class, they don't have to prove anything. Whatever field Nicolaitanism is found in brings destruction, bondage, destruction to the people. We see Nicolaitanism in the Catholic priesthood. 
They took the Bible away from the people. And they say, the Catholic priests are the only ones that can read the Bible. You're not allowed to touch it. Tyndale said, I'm going to make it to where a plowboy will have will know more of the Bible than the Pope does. I'm going to put it in English and give the Bible to the people so they may check their teachers. But what did you have for centuries? You had a domination of the people. A Nike, a Nicolaitan system of the people where they're dominated by a priesthood of experts who have been licensed by the state or church. Hey, we see this same Nicolaitanism in the bureaucratic domination of almost every industry or skill in America today. What can you do in America without a license? What can you do in America today without being certified? What can you do in America without having some Nicolaitan telling you, you can't do that, you're not certified, you do not have a license, you can't teach, you do not have a license. And if people that are licensed say, I hate this system, and they begin to disagree, and they say, our system is hurting people, they are punished. They are silenced. They lose everything. Do you know that in the state of Florida today, you have the Dance Studio Act? I didn't say you had a dance studio. I said you have a Dance Studio Act. What is a Dance Studio Act? It is legislation. It is a law. You know what the law says? You can't teach ballroom dancing in Florida without a license. You must be certified. Now, I don't recommend you go learn ballroom dancing. And I hope you don't teach it. However, is it not absolutely insane that somebody can't set up shop and teach ballroom dancing without a license. Nicolaitanism. Hey, they're looking out from you. God forbid you take lessons and learn ballroom dancing from somebody not licensed. You might learn a wrong step. End up with a boogie woogie when you thought you were doing ballroom dancing. They have to protect you. They're always looking out for you, folks. Hey, they'll save you from the quack doctors who may heal you with natural, wholesome medicines. Oh, don't worry. They'll protect you. They'll protect you from quack dance teachers. They'll protect you from quack doctors. Oh, their licensing will protect you from anything and everything. Oh, by the way, there are licensed foot doctors. And they work to make sure that you now have the best modern running and walking shoes. Without them and these wise doctors with their expert opinions, you might get injured. You might start jogging and running and end up with a knee injury or a foot injury or a back injury. Your spinal cord, I mean the whole, your back might get out of whack. Aren't you glad you have experts to protect you? You know what? When you think about Nicolaitanism, it's no wonder that the first modern athletic shoe was named Nike. Dr. Daniel Lieberman, professor of biological anthropology at Harvard University, says until 1972, when the modern athletic shoe was invented, the Nike, people ran in very thin-soled shoes and had very strong feet and had much lower incidence of injuries. Did you just read that? See, this is one of the expert crowd coming out from the pack. But you get in trouble when you do that, see. 
What does he say? He basically says that before 1972, people did what Jesus recommended. They had very minimal shoe and they didn't have many injuries. And they had strong feet. Because they said if you watch this thing on video, your feet... I mean, that thing just conforms to the ground. It takes, it's designed to take lots of punishment. I tell you what, it's designed to be in touch with that ground. And it gets strong. Oh, but somebody's going to protect you. Let me read you. I'll paraphrase in some places, but... There's an article that says, Our running shoes a waste of money. A $20 billion running shoe industry wants us to believe that the latest technologies will cushion every stride. But injuries for runners are on the rise. And everything we've been told about running shoes is wrong. For example, you might notice the Terra Humera tribe in Mexico where you have the best long-distance runners in the world. And they are virtually barefoot with a minimal shoe. You will see them running 300 miles at 57 years old. And you will see them winning every single race and contest. And they don't get hurt. They're not hurt. They're not injured. They have zero casualty rate. The modern shoe was invented by Nike. Before it, the only shock absorption came from the compression of the legs. You don't want to run on your heel, so you have to run on the balls of your feet. And you do just like these uh, Mexican tribe does. You, you allow your leg to compress as it hits the ground. Who wants to demonstrate it? Nobody. All right. All right. The inventor, though, was Bowerman. Now, he's an expert because he started jogging at 50 years old. No, that's when he started. Some expert, huh? So Bowerman, the inventor of the Nike athletic shoe that was invented until 19, in 1972, started jogging at 50 years old, and he came up with the idea of putting huge chunks of rubber under your heel. And he called his first Nike shoe the Cortez. And the writer of the article says Cortez was the one who plundered the new world and unleashed smallpox. Nice name for the shoe. They now sell athletic shoes in excess of $17 billion annually. Now, do you think somebody wants you touching $17 billion? So, Nike and other companies have been challenged. Show less injury. You've had all these decades. Show that your shoe leads to either number one, less injury, or number two, better athletic performance. Silence. Silence. Show. Prove. Where's the documentation? Where are the stats? Show us. I wanted to run one time and an expert runner told me, oh, you need to spend a lot of money for a shoe. And I did so. And I'm not lying. I had all kinds of injuries. I felt my leg all messed up and all types of... But, but they told me that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what everybody thinks. So where is the documentation? Where's the evidence? Runners wearing expensive athletic shoes are 
3% more likely to get injured than with cheaper ones. That's from a 1989 study by Dr. Bernard Marty in Switzerland. It was confirmed again in 1991 in medicine, science, and sports exercise. If it doesn't keep you from injury and it doesn't improve athletic performance, what do people pay all the money for? I tell you what, they found out that the more the injury, I'm sorry, the more the price, the greater the pain and injury. The more you spend on a shoe, the greater your risk of injury. Who is behind such a system as that? I know a lot of Nicolaitan systems that are like that. The more money you pay, uh, the more you let them help you, the more you end up cursed. Boy, I think Satan's behind that. The love of money is the root of all evil, and evil includes harming people, doesn't it? New York Magazine says how we're wrecking our feet. April 21st, 2008, researchers in South Africa published a study titled Shod versus Unshod. Published in journals, they concluded by comparing American feet to ancient skeletons that prior to the invention of modern shoes, people had healthier feet. They conclude in their study that most of the commercially available footwear is not good for the feet. Well, that certainly agrees with the Bible. This is true for running or so-called athletic or exercise shoes. But what about for fighting? Certainly for fighting. I mean, our chapter in Ephesians chapter 6 is about sword fighting, is it not? So obviously then, you need a big modern combat boot if you're going to fight. We're not talking about running anymore. We're talking about sword fighting. When you go back and look at the ancient... Roman soldier, he used a sandal with socks. Sometimes they say, sometimes, not every time, but sometimes they say he had small little tacks in the bottom to help him stick on the ground. But the Jews thought that was ridiculous. And they didn't use those little tacks. And not all the Roman soldiers did. But if you really begin to study this thing, Brother Burson found this for me. Let me read it for you. The Association for Renaissance Martial Arts. Okay, so we're going back and looking at historical martial arts, sword fighting and that type of thing. And they're going to tell you, these experts at the Association for Renaissance Martial Arts, they have tons of documentation. Here's what they say. Nothing reveals the mediocre skills quicker, in my opinion, than noting what a student wears on their feet when training in these skills. Countless times I have lamented practitioners who insisted on wearing ridiculous work boots or modern combat boots and their teachers as well. The facts are that if you look through the historical sources, almost without exception, you will see image after image of slim, flat, slipper-like shoes. You will not find heavy boots. You will not find shoes with thick heels. You will not find shoes with thick soles. Even when you do see high-rise footwear, they typically appear uh, thin with flat soles. From the 13th century manuscript uh, to the late 17th century works of Pashkin and Peter, there is an undeniable common element detectable among the footwear of Renaissance martial arts illustrations. They all have slipper light shoes. Try to find a pair of heeled boots or heavy-looking shoes on a combatant. Fighting men obviously knew something about the necessity for light, close-fitting footwear. The consistency in the footwear illustrations across regions and centuries cannot be denied. Heels on shoes were historically for one purpose, fitting in stirrups. Later, they were for fashion. And he goes on to quote some historical sources that show even when you had men wearing riding boots with heels to fit in the stirrup, if they got in a sword fight, they always took their heels off. Keeping the ground, uh, keeping the 
feel of the ground and the ball of the foot planted. So it helps you step and turn and leap on diverse ground. You know, Deborah arose as a mother in Israel. And she complained that there was not a sword or spirit among the men. They had all become passive. It is sad today to look at your warrior man and see him all dressed in high heels. Is it any wonder, though, in a day when men can be knocked over so easily? Now, you know, they need to invent another construction shoe. If you need something to keep iron things from falling on your shoe and to keep from stepping on things, I understand your dilemma there. But we're talking about fighting and running and exercise. And maybe some of you can make a lot of money inventing a construction shoe that... uh will not hurt your feet and throw your back out of whack, but will also protect you somehow in the workplace. So just give me, be sure to tithe if you make the money. Um, Is it any wonder in a day when men can be knocked over so easy physically that they can also be knocked over so easy spiritually? You know, there's a fashion for high heels among women, too. Hey, what do you think it's doing to their feet? Think it's helping? The Bible speaks of the virtuous woman as being strong and energetic and industrious. That's the goal, isn't it? Certainly... It is God's goal that Christian women walk in their full physical potential, whatever that is. There will be afflictions, there will be problems, sicknesses. But the point here is to walk in your fullest potential, physically. I thought about this Friday night as it was raining and some of the brethren wanted to go soul winning in the rain. and I Praise God for them. So as we were soul winning in the rain, I saw this young lady walking down the road in high heels. And she would take two steps. I'm not going to show you. Brother Lando, will you show how she was walking? All right, brother. I can't get you to do nothing today. Amen. Praise God for Brother Lando. She was walking. I'm not going to demonstrate how she was walking. But she'd take two steps and then she would trip and have to catch herself. And take two more steps and then trip. And she's going down the sidewalk. And I just said, you know, that's just ridiculous. I mean, to get out of here trying to walk down the sidewalk, you're about to break your neck. Satan did that. Satan did that. God didn't do that. Satan did that. We can go back to 1913. The Ogden Standard said headaches and eye strain and spinal difficulties and disturbances of internal organs result from extreme high heels. You get tortured feet that bring wrinkles to your face. The wearer ties early and they are irritable. Hmm. They weren't very fond of high heels, were they? You know, one thing interesting about high heels... If your heel goes up, what happens to your shoulders and your neck? Now you're walking like that, right? So you have to fight to try to hold it back, but everything is pushing against you. So daily, you're trying not to walk over. That's why she was kind of slipping and falling over and having to do whatever she could to keep her balance. So now you're hunched. It's pushing you over. You reckon that's good for the spine to do that all day? Doesn't sound good to me. Harold and Presbyter in 1919 says the University of Illinois produced a paper titled Fashion, Its Use and Abuse. 1919, it tells about the permanent disfigurement of feminine feet brought about by the high heel shoes of the day. Should we be surprised if boys grow to disrespect girls and dishonor them as objects? Well, that's certainly what boys have become in our generation. Christian mothers, are you willing to be in any degree responsible for the awful harvest of immorality that's sure to follow some of the fashions of today? What did they predict that was coming in 1919? 
a horrible harvest of immorality. Can anybody say 1960s and 1970s? If not, if you don't want to be responsible, I'm sure you will join those who are lifting up their voices in protest. Let every woman who loves her children and her country do the patriotic thing. That's what the Christians thought of it all. Let's see, 1921, there's this lady. You've seen her before. She gets an article in the New York Times. Is there a decline in American morals? She's basically telling all these other people, don't you worry, everything is fine. She says, think of the towns that are passing laws forbidding high hills. As you go through around the country, you had townships and cities basically passing laws saying it's illegal because it's immodest and they use the health argument to ban it. Here's San Antonio Light, 1927. Let's see, the title of my message is uh, Devilish Shoes. Let's see what they say. Beware, girls. High hills like these will change your feet to hoofs in time. <laughs> Talk about devilish feet. I don't know what to think about that. But I tell you what, the devil could. He changed your feet into hoofs. The Waterloo Evening Post, 1929. High heels to change the shape of legs. Women will soon roll about like apes. High heels are causing a change in the shape of women's legs and are responsible for more feet trouble than all other causes combined. Changes in posture and spinal curvature follow. Wow. Change it into hoofs and change your leg into where you don't have one no more hardly. Boy, if they're even half right, that's, that's dreadful, isn't it? Allen writes a book in 1931 called Only Yesterday. He said the YWCA conducted a national campaign against immodest dress among high school girls, supplying newspapers with headlines such as High Hills Losing Ground, even in France. Oakland Tribune in 1950 says researchers have discovered that high heels disturb balance, hence hasten foot fatigue. Oakland, Oakland Tribune of 1962, high heels are like drinking and smoking or bad for the health. American women, though, are firmly convinced that high heels make them attractive. The same high heels that make them foot cripples with their feet halfway between a tourniquet and a vice. One lady that has a column for ladies in the Capital Times in 1964, Mary Brandell Hopkins, says the lewdness of pill, the lewdness of pill of deep diving necklines, bare backs, figure cuddling, uh, cuddling dress silhouettes, sheer hosiery is the subject of a lot of printer's ink. The shorter, more what? Mincing steps. Remember that word. The shorter, more mincing steps a woman must take and a high heel shoe tend to create an impression on men and has a hypnotic effect on the male eye. Dating back 3,000 years, higher heels have always been worn solely for lewd appeal. The peekaboo look at the toes or heel is motivated by the same reason as slits in the dresses or skirts. In the opinion of Don Lopez, the top Hollywood designer today, nothing is so attractive to a man as a well-turned female heel. This is exhaustingly confirmed by historians and researchers. Many times in history, exposure of the feet has been censored by official decree. To show naked toes, heel, art has been condemned as obscene. It is only now that Americans are discovering what the rest of the world recognized for thousands of years. And if you look at stores that try to sell lewd sandals, you'll see that they're starting to recognize what all mankind has recognized and what other countries have certainly recognized for thousands of years. Now, in light of her words, look at Isaiah chapter 3. The Lord is angry at some women of Zion. He says, The Lord saith, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, now don't miss this, walk with stretched forth necks. What's going on? I wonder why their necks are stretched forward. Let's see, walking and mincing as they go. I wonder why they're mincing. Let's see, if you're mincing and you're leaning forward, you must have on high heels. Making a tinkling with their feet. 
Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. 1970, the Post Register says high hills can be disaster. Terrence Vander Heiden, DPM, 2008. Oh, you have all kinds of articles out today about this. High hills can cause feet problems while exasperating problems that you already have. Le leg and back pain also are common complaints. You have other articles like high heel horrors, the hidden cost. Research suggests that up to a third of women suffer permanent problems, irreversible damage to leg tendons. Other articles say lewd TV shows like lewdness in the city have spawned a new craze among women. For high heels again. Marcel Danesi, director of semiotics. That is, a trying to interpret various signs and symbols in society. Director of semiotics and communication theory at University of Toronto, 1999. For what it's worth, he writes an article or book called Cigarettes and High Heels. He says, why is it that certain members of the human species routinely put their survival at risk by smoking cigarettes? Why is it that some females make walking a struggle for themselves by donning high heel footwear? He goes on and says high heels are signs. They are uncomfortable and awkward to wear, yet millions of women wear them. To a male, high heel shoes are eye-catching. But does the Lord want Christian sisters being eye-catching in this way? No. He wants you to be beautiful, a natural beauty, a holy, godly, devout beauty. Not an enticing beauty. When we have time in upcoming weeks, I want to develop in detail what all of this in the physical means in the spiritual. But for now, I just want to say, if you have big hills, you don't have to step in the mud and get dirty, right? You can't feel much. You're not very stable. It sounds like what that represents spiritually are Christians deciding to be men pleasers, never getting out in the road where the Lord told them to get, in the marketplace where Paul daily debated with people. They never give the people any strong medicine. They're crowd pleasers. They don't want to rock any boats. They don't want to make anybody mad. And they're compromising the gospel. They're quiet. The old ways used to be, you come up to church, you get together, you pray, you go soul winning, you get out here, and you get out in street freak. That used to be how people did it in older days. But what do they do today? Do they have on the shoes, the soul winning shoes? No. They have high platform show shoes. You can't walk very good in them, but they're not meant for walking. They're meant for getting up here and putting on a show. Instead of soul winning, what have churches become today? Entertainment. Have they not? Instead of soul winning churches with people active in evangelism, you have them active in everything else. But, the same time that the shoes have been changed in the physical, they've been changed in the spiritual. Do you see it? Is the average church in America a street preaching, soul winning, door knocking, preaching against the abortion clinic? Hey, we need to expand. We need to get even more involved in these things. Amen? I tell you what, they, they say that these things are the life of a church. I know Jesus is the life, but Jesus tells us what to do. And He tells us to put our shoes on, right? And the Bible says that these shoes will be protection in your spiritual warfare. They keep you from thinking so much about yourself and getting so consumed with poor me and your self-pity and your own problem and, and getting introspective. It gets you involved in the bigger picture of the Lord's business, the King's business, and it keeps you active. Nothing brings you closer to a man of God than getting out on the street and being persecuted with Him. I tell you what, bearing the shame 
It brings revival to have people slam the door in your face. I see kids light up and start getting revival. I see them start praying for the first time. Why are you praying now? Why are you on fire for God? You got doors slammed in your face for Jesus. I tell you what, you bear that shame and the Lord comes and fellowships with you. But a lot of people don't want to bear the shame. They don't want to put on those shoes. And the churches of America and the preachers of America, they got big hair and big shoes but they're not preachers anymore. They're not soul winners anymore. Spurgeon said, a man that hadn't preached outdoors is not worth his salt. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. What are some of the high hills that are causing instability in this day and age? What are some of the shoes the devil gives people to keep them from soul winning. What about this one? I witness by my lifestyle only. That's not, that's not God's shoe. Oh, no. I, I, I'm not one of these fanatic, born-again Bible thumpers. I witness by my lifestyle. But as far as I see in your lifestyle, you look worldly. You're going up to the movie. If not, the bar. What do you mean? You, what kind of witness do you have? What is your lifestyle saying? How many people have walked up and just saw you at a bar or theater and said, I want to be like you? I believe you ought to witness by your lifestyle. But is that all the Lord said? Absolutely not. But that's what people have done today. In the 1970s, at the same time the Nike shoe was replacing all the running shoes in America, preachers began publishing books on lifestyle evangelism that said, don't preach verbally. Just witness by your lifestyle. Do you not find that ironic? I find it very ironic. But I could give you more examples of how the spiritual and physical parallel one another. What about this high hill? I don't want to offend anyone by telling them they are sinners or headed to the lake of fire. You folks are doing it wrong. You ought not tell people they need Jesus and that they're going to hell. Oh, but if somebody's on a railroad track about to be hit by a train, you say, get off! You're about to be run over by a train! But we're not to tell them to beware of hell fire. What kind of insanity is that? But when that stuff is preached to you over and over and over, you're not stable anymore. People don't go soul winning. What about this high hill? I'm not good at soul winning. I don't really like it. That's what Moses said. God said, who made your tongue? Who made man's mouth? Oh, Jeremiah says, I'm too young. You've got to call somebody else. It's our natural tendency to tell God, no, find somebody else. God said, go. 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 Witness. Witness everywhere you go. You know, it'll bring stability. It'll bring stability. I don't spend time at your job and when you should be working. I mean, but certainly there's a time when you can witness at your workplace. But be wise. Be wise and responsible. He's not paying you to witness, is he? What about this high hill? I don't want to be legalistic about it. I mean, I believe in soul winning, but you folks are legalistic about it, you know. You've got to set time when you go, and I don't want to be legalistic. Well, that's destroyed more Christians. That's destroyed more Christians. What about this high hill? Oh, I used to do that. I've done enough of that for my Christian life. What about this high hill? Preaching should only be done in church building by preachers. Well, that'll make you unstable, won't it? That'll take away your soul winning fire, won't it? Hey, I'll give you one more. I want to be relevant. Evangelizing people's not relevant today. It's offensive and self-righteous. As if I have all the answers. I want to meet people where they are and be relevant to what they're going through today. These are the high hills that the devil gives preachers and Christians today that will put out your fire. 
Oh, there's many more. I could keep listening to them. But the whole point of all of it, I'll just sum it up. The devil wants you to be a fashionable Christian. A relevant Christian. A culturally accepted Christian. Instead of an obedient, profitable, responsible, zealous, diligent, soul winning Christian. You understand? And it's all in the shoes, folks. Spiritual shoes. I pray all of us get our soul winning shoes on. Amen? Take your fancy Nikes off. I'm not going to jump all over. You want to go out here running Nikes? Have at it. But you better put your spiritual shoes on. Amen? And let's definitely get off these immodest shoes that are hurting you. I, I believe it's good to be wise. And I believe the Lord wants us to be wise. And He certainly doesn't want you immodest. So as Sister Lynn comes and sings for us today, let's ask the Lord to renew our zeal. You say, I'm already lit. Let's ask Him to keep us lit. Amen? And I think we could all use a little more soul winning zeal. I think it'll wake up this church and bless us in ways that you have not imagined. I'll say one more thing, then I'll hush. I think that the secret to peace and joy and fellowship, I think it's found right here. Why don't you try it? God says, taste and see. Why don't you try it? Dear God, I pray You'll bless as the folks come forward. God's calling you. There's a prayer need. God's spoken to you today. Why don't you come? Why don't you come pray? Why don't you ask God for some fire? Dear God, I do pray that You'd let Your fire... Oh, not Your fire of judgment, Lord. Let Your fire of boldness and power fall upon us, God. Wherever we're at and whatever we can do, Lord, and let us be honest about what we can do, Lord, with You and Your power. Use us, God, to pray for souls and to preach and speak and witness and evangelize. To get the shoes back on, Lord, and to get off the devil's fancy shoes in the name of Jesus. Take up thy cross and follow me, I heard my master say. Oh, let's get out there. Come on. I gave my life to ransom thee, surrender your all today. Yes, indeed. Surrender. Wherever he leads, I'll go. What about you? Wherever he leads, I'll go. Can you even hear his voice? I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. It may be through the shadows dim or o'er the stormy sea. I take the cross and follow Him wherever He leadeth me. Oh, yes. Amen. Wherever He leads, I'll go. Wherever He leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever He leads, I'll go. My heart, my life, Bless him, my Lord. all Help I Help Him, God. Bless Him. To Christ who loves me so. He is my Master, Lord, and King. Stability. Wherever 